Hi, welcome back to Game Innovation. Today, I want to start off with a broad question. What is interestingness? How can we make something and ensure that it's interesting before people even have the chance to engage with it? It's a big question, but not entirely a new one. In 1960, for instance, psychologist Daniel Berlin explored the concept through collative variables like novelty, complexity, and surprise, all features that affect how interesting stimulus feels. But because these depend on prior experience, it's nearly impossible to generalize what makes something interesting. In the 60 years since Berlin's Conflict, Arousal, and Curiosity, which itself admits to functioning as a book primarily dedicated to raising problems, not solving them, there have been other attempts to tackle this question. Jürgen Schmidhuber, for example, posited that interestingness is tied directly to learning, that the brain is most engaged when it makes progress towards understanding something. In other words, interestingness is the first derivative of the learning process. But even in the midst of countless theories and studies, a true definitive answer remains elusive. But if we limit our scope a little, there are certain factors which can indicate a higher likelihood of interestingness. And if we were somehow able to generate new, novel experiences that met those standards, that could become a powerful tool for designers looking to explore fresh ideas that resonate with players. And this is where we can get to the paper that we'll be covering today. Gavel, Generating Games via Evolution and Language Models by Graham Todd and collaborators. This work attempts to generate not just new, novel games, but ones that also have the potential to be interesting to players. Even that first step is a lot harder than it sounds, though. The scope of games is so massive and so varying in quality that creating a brand new game based on existing game rules and components would create a massively bloated, often nonsensical array of outputs which likely couldn't even be classified as games even in the most generous of terms. So a few key things that need to be considered are how can we limit our scope and how can we create a reliable structure that will ensure the integrity of a new game's rule set. And thankfully, the answer to both questions is the same. Ludi. Ludi is a system with over 1,000 classic and modern board games, each defined using its own structured language. Games are built off of high-level keywords called ludemes, which dictate what players can and can't do. Keywords like hop and step. Gavel was trained on this dataset of Ludi games, although its goal wasn't to understand game rules holistically to produce brand new game experiences in their entirety. Instead, it was built to modify smaller sections of games to produce an offshoot of that experience. This directly handles the issue of randomness and unplayable outputs. By modifying games rather than creating them from scratch, a balance can be struck between novelty and games that still make sense. The model would choose a random expression to erase from the original game's Ludi code, taking note of both the prefix and the suffix to that expression to understand the context, after which it would try to fill in the middle. With enough training, it should be able to predict something fairly accurate to fill the space with. Of course, the problem that arises is that if the model does its job properly and gets incredibly good at this filling in process, it should in theory start filling in the middle with the exact information that was in the original game, which means it doesn't modify anything at all. To circumvent this issue, a subset of games from Ludi was left off the training dataset and was presented to the model afterwards to ensure that the system hadn't seen this particular set of prefixes and suffixes before. This produced a large set of modified game outputs, although there was no way of knowing at this point which of these outputs had any real value to players. So then comes the evaluation stage, which can be handily explained by this pseudocode. The algorithm takes a generated game input and conducts a fitness evaluation, giving each game a score based on a few important metrics. 
If the game failed to compile at all or wasn't playable for some reason, it would automatically receive a terrible evaluation score. Then, if a set of two random agents played the game and one had a significantly higher win rate than the other, indicating terrible balancing, or the majority of game states only allowed for one legal move, indicating a lack of player agency, the game would receive a poor evaluation score. After that, the evaluation moves on to non-random agents playing the game, specifically Monte Carlo Tree Search agents. Monte Carlo Tree Search is a planning algorithm where agents don't know the rules in advance, but explore the game by simulating possible future moves and outcomes. They focus more on moves that seem most likely to lead to a win, and less on moves that go nowhere, effectively employing strategy without even knowing the details of the game. If you want to check out a full explanation of Monte Carlo Tree Search, a link will be provided in the description. After running a set of playouts from the Monte Carlo agents, the exact final fitness evaluation of a playable game is determined by five factors. Balance, decisiveness, completion, agency, and coverage. In addition to these, there was a sixth metric called strategic depth, where a Monte Carlo agent played against a random agent to see if strategy was important to success. These six factors gave the game an ultimate fitness evaluation score. The better the score, the more likely the game was to be interesting. To add more dimensionality to these results, an evolutionary search strategy called Map Elites was employed. A full breakdown of Map Elites is a little outside the scope of this video, but in broad terms, it ensures that the best results aren't just the results of the highest evaluation scores. It takes into account the behavioral characteristics of the games, things like asynchronicity, what type of board the game is played on, core attributes of the game's rule sets, etc., and creates an assortment of cells that represent different types of games. This way, instead of only considering the highest scoring games, which may heavily overlap in behavior, we consider the highest scoring games in each cell, drastically increasing the diversity of the most useful outputs. And a key element to this is that because the new games are created by mutating existing ones, this process is evolutionary. Each generation of games informs the next, allowing the system to not only search broadly across the design space, but also gradually improve the quality of games over time. The experimentation process was extensive, and I encourage you to read the paper, which will be linked below, to get a full grasp of what was produced and the promise that it shows. But overall, the paper concludes that Gavel succeeds in both creating a wide range of different game types, which occupy many map elite cells, and producing many high fitness games. In other words, it can in fact create novel and interesting experiences. A few examples are Hop Through and Yavago, the former being a modification of Checkers, where you don't actually capture pieces but instead hop over them and attempt to reach the other side, and the latter tasking you with putting five of your game pieces in a row to win, but if you place four in a row, you lose. It also incorporates a rule from Go, where if you enclose a player's pieces with your own, you remove them. Interestingly, this game is a modification of yet another AI-generated game called Yavalath, which came from Cameron Brown's 2009 work that tackled a similar problem, but at a smaller scale with less diversity. Ultimately, this paper is a significant step in generating novel and interesting games, and provides a well-structured evaluation tool for games of this nature although its authors are the first to admit that, like with most game AI projects, it completely falters without the aid of human evaluators and designers. It was ultimately humans that picked the best games from the batch of viable options that the model provided, and if you were to exponentially increase the scope of this project, it would be humans that would occasionally, perhaps inexplicably, find games interesting for the exact reason that the evaluator deemed them imbalanced or incomplete. It's also undeniable, in fact it's the point, 
that these generated games are operating squarely within a space that's been predefined by many games that came before, which means that there is an implicit upper limit to just how novel they can be. But for idea generation, for evaluating handcrafted mechanics, or simply for furthering our understanding of what players gravitate towards, tools inspired by this work could prove to be invaluable to game designers in the near future. If you enjoyed this quick dive into Gavel and the generation of interesting games, make sure to subscribe and check out the full paper in the description below. You can also watch the previous video on discrete absorbing diffusion for Minecraft terrain, and be on the lookout for more videos in the coming weeks which will cover new advancements in game design and technology.